So pursuing on this, this um, sort of theme of infinite versus finite dimensions, um, today I'd like to uh, talk about basically um, talk about instantons. So it's a, again a, sort of a, some aspects are, are very well known, but there's still things that I think need a little bit of elucidation. Um, so for most of the lecture, this is going to be um, going to have x to be a complex surface. So in other words, it's a fourfold. Um, it's going to have a Kähler form. And um, so just to sort of say the, the, the Euclidean example, basically gives you the metric. So it's a two form, and the key property is that it's closed. Um, the other ingredient is going to be a, a, a C infinity bundle over X. Um, now, um, say rank n, it's going to have, I want it to be unitary, so it has a metric, Hermitian form. And um, I'm going to be looking at, uh, at connections on these things. So in other words, I'm going to be taking, um, well, sections of E to sections of E tensor the, the one forms. And it's a covariant derivative. And locally, A, D, nabla A just looks like D plus a matrix of one forms. Um, this, this creature comes with a curvature, which as you know, a covariant derivative um, gives you a, uh, a way of taking a section of a vector bundle and transporting it along a curve. And the curvature sort of sees what happens when you take it along a little square. And the, the point is that uh, integrating in one direction and in the other is not always compatible. And the thing that measures that is the curvature. So you've got, um, again, it's locally. Well, if this is the local expression, it's just dA plus A by J. OK. Um, now, <clears throat> the, uh, the, uh, if the, you want a connection to be unitary, that just means that if I take the scalar product of two sections, it satisfies a Leibniz rule. And uh, if you want it to define a holomorphic structure, see this takes the, the derivative in all directions at once. You just take the anti-holomorphic directions. And the difference with a a um, Riemann surface or a curve is that there's a, an integrability condition, which is a base of the curvature. So we'll get to that uh, equals zero. So this an integrability Okay. 
So these are sort of the, the, uh, the actors. Um, and um, there's perhaps a, uh, a statement that should be made, which is that if you want to put the two together, if you have a unitary structure and you fix the anti-holomorphic piece, then there's a unique holomorphic piece that goes with it, essentially because in a Hermitian basis, these, these things will be um, um, minus the uh, star of each other. So um, if you put the two together, there's a unique nabla given d bar and unitary. So it's a little lemma. It's known as the Chern connection. Um, now, just to, to remind you what happens in, in uh, two complex dimensions, um, you have this, this curvature here, which is, in fact, a, uh, it's an endomorphism E value 2 form. So I just want to remind you, it's OK? Um, you have this two form, and if you look at what two forms do, you have the, the Hodge star operator, which takes from P to, um, sorry, omega P, or P forms to 2n minus P forms. Um, so what it does is basically, um, defined by the relationship that um, eta psi times the volume form, so you take the scalar product, is equal to um, eta wedge star psi. Now, as you're on a, what's essentially a four manifold, omega two maps to omega two. So on omega two, you've got star squared equals the identity, and you find, therefore, that they're plus or minus one eigenspaces. OK. Now, if you look at uh, how this breaks out with respect to the complex structure, you've got that the two forms, they split. Well, I'll just split directly the curvature, because that's the thing that interests me. Um, there'll be the the sort of anti-holomorphic piece. So here I'll just write what it looks like in the, well, in, in coordinates, if you want, or in the, in the Euclidean case. The, these are the, they've got two barred terms, dz1 bar, which dz2 bar. And then there's the opposite thing, which has two dz terms. Then there's the piece of the 1, 1 forms. So these, have, these are mixed. They'll have a dz and a dz bar. Um, but this is a piece that is lined up with the Kähler form. So if I'm pretending for the moment that I'm in Euclidean space, it's going to be um, sort of multiples of dz1 wedge dz1 bar plus dz2 wedge dz2 bar. And then there's the other piece, which is the piece that's orthogonal to it. So this is one dimension. This is one dimension. That's one. And this is three. And if you're going to have plus or minus one eigenspaces, something that squares to one, what basically happens is these three have to line up. And these will be the self-dual. And these will be the anti-self-dual forms. OK, so you, you want the, um, the uh, thing. And we're going to be interested in anti-self-dual connections. So we want this bit to vanish and just have that left. OK, and so it's asking the piece of the curvature vanish. And that also solves a, solves a variational problem, which is essentially minimizing the L2 norm of curvature. 
Okay. So, um, so the connection nabla is anti-self-dual if and only if um, Okay. Now, um, what happens with this game is basically you can get, if you start with something that's already holomorphic, so it has a, a complex or holomorphic structure, um, this one comes for free. If on top of it it's unitary, that one comes for free. And so basically all you're left with is solving this one. Now the other thing to, to know um, is that these bundles, they come with, with two topological numbers basically that you're sort of interested in, at least in four. So they're two churn classes, known imaginatively as C1 and C2. Um, with the first churn class, you can define a degree. The first churn class is essentially the trace of the curvature. Okay, so you have a degree, which would be the integral over x of the trace of f wedge omega. So you build in the, the uh, Kähler form to your notion of degree. And um, that's your topological invariant. Now, what that implies basically is that this piece, if your degree is going to be non-zero, then you have to have some curvature there. Otherwise, it just won't work. And what, um, so the best you can do basically, because you're looking at a trace, is to arrange all your curvature along the diagonal. And as you're thinking of an L2 norm, you actually want those terms all to be the same as much as possible. So um, more generally, um, the uh, connection will be Hermit Einstein. If and only if, well, you want the 0, 2, F2, 0 equals 0. And you want the F11 piece to be equal to some constant times the identity, because it's an endomorphism, times the 2 form, omega. Okay, so as I was saying, with the, both of these, if you start with something that's holomorphic and unitary, you're, you're two-thirds of the way there. Okay, now, as for curves, um, this equation um, is variational. So um, these equations have, have symmetries. Um, one which is a real symmetry, which is just a group of all gauge transformations. So they're symmetries. Um, so unitary gauge transformations. So changes of basis, if you want in this bundle um, at least they okay and um, if you're looking at the space of all connections so you've got a group I'll call script G. A will be all unitary and say, well, unitary connections. Um, and I might as well put in the, the complex integrability. Though this, that makes life a little bit more complicated because then it's no longer an affine space. Um, 
So you put this, this thing, you look at the, the quotient on G, which is gauge equivalence classes. Um, and if I define, say, F of a connection A to be the integral over X of the L2 norm of the curvature, um, you have the following picture. So here's, here's the space of connections of A mod G. Here's your um, functional F. You will have a space of minima here, which will be the, the Hermite-Einstein connections, um, or gauge equivalence classes of them. Now, what you can do also is that you can complexify this group. So, also, GC. So these will be complex gauge transformations. Now, what that will do is basically it behaves as a symmetry of this half, but it doesn't preserve the unitary structure. Okay, so it just keeps this bit, but it defines the same holomorphic structure. It's a complex change of basis, basically. Okay, so acts on the D-bar operators. And so what you get are these pictures where you get orbits like this. Um, so this will be a GC orbit. Okay, the G orbit is here is just a point because you've quotient it out. So I'm not quite sure if you should call it a GC orbit, but it's what remains once you remove the the G. Okay, so the question or the variational content of the, the equation is you can try to minimize the, this curvature along this orbit. Um, and for some you can't, and for some you can't. And the, the theorem um, so by various people, but Donaldson first Uhlenbeck and Yao, and their variants on it, done by various people, um, is that um, you can minimize if and only if um, E is a stable holomorphic bundle. And if you try sort of variationally and take a minimizing sequence, if the thing isn't stable, the sort of de destabilizing bundle sort of pops out in the, uh, when you take this, uh, this sequence. Um, so stable, it's the same definition as the, for curves, so it's the slope of F is lesser than the slope. And I should put, there's a usual disclaimer here, it can be a sum of stable things of the same slope. So slope of F less than um, slope of E for all um, sub-bundles. Okay, and the slope is again, it's the degree over the rank. So the same, same definition as last time, and it's the same idea. You can minimize if and only if it's stable. In fact, you get, for Hermit-Einstein, you get this, this constraint in all, all dimensions. Okay. So you have this very nice picture as long as you stick to a complex orbit. Okay, so you move along this orbit and then you um, will go to the minima if the thing is stable. If it isn't stable, you can get hung up on a higher order critical point, which might not be the same bundle as the um, one you first thought of. And various other things can happen. So, so, but if it's stable, the, the uh, and the bundle sort of lies in that orbit. So it's not as you, the structure is unchanged in the limit. Okay. So um, you've got the holomorphic object. You put a unitary structure on it. 
you think of it in the space of all connections, it solves a variational problem if it's stable. So the moduli of stable bundles ends up being the moduli of these Hermite-Einstein connections. Um, if the degree is zero, it's the anti-self-dual one. And it's basically those I'm going to concentrate on. Okay, so we've got this, this picture where there's the, the holomorphic objects, which are the um, the bundles, the vector bundles, holomorphic vector bundles, and you put in an extra structure, which is a unitary structure, and you get this extra equation, which is the anti-self-dual. So basically moduli of stable bundles moduli of Hermite-Einstein or anti-self-dual, and this is degree zero, um, connections. Okay. Um, and you see it's the same thing we had for curves. It's a bundle of stable bundles for curves, and there they were either flat or, again, Hermite-Einstein, so they had central constant curvature. Here, there's, there's, you need some other curvature because you've not only got the, the first turn class, but you have a second turn class that has to have enough curvature to live there. So it's not, they're not just flat. Okay. So in a similar, eye, a similar vein to um, what I was talking about last week, if you forget the orbits now, the complex group, and just minimize in this big space. And the question is, what do you get? So if you forget. Moduli of stable bundle, arbitrary C2 there? Hmm? Left hand side, moduli of stable bundle, C1 equal to 0, C2 is arbitrary. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So they're, they're, they're numbers on both sides. Yeah. So forget the complex orbits. As a matter of fact, also forget the integrability. What happens if you just try to minimize? functional directly. Okay? Just sort of try to take it down straight. Um, well, then, then bad things happen. And it's a problem that was um, um, identified quite early by uh, by Uhlenbeck. Um, and uh, what happens is that curvature concentrates as you're as you're taking a, take a minimizing sequence. the curvature can concentrate at points. At points. So you get um, and, and the limit, you get a delta function. So, um, now of course, you could have chosen a good sequence and then things are okay, it's, but you can choose a bad sequence and things, things don't work well. Um, from a variational point of view, at least from the, the, the analyst point of view, you, you use for all of these things, it's sort of done in, in various Sobolev spaces and it's a critical exponent for the, uh, the Sobolev theory and so it, the, the compactness of the function spaces you'd hope to get isn't quite there, but is just enough to 
um, get some good news that goes with this bad news, which is that the, uh, the um, curvature um, concentrates away from points. So the theorem of Uhlenbeck is that the, on the, um, well, on the fourfold, you get a good limit away from a finite set of points. Now what this means basically is you get a good limit everywhere, but you've got a finite set of points where the thing's bubbled. So maybe that should be put within quotation marks. Um, and your limit object can have C2 of lower degree. Okay, so you've got a certain amount of what the physicists would call topological charge, and you've lost some charge in the limit. It's gone into this delta function, and in the limit it just disappears. Okay. So um, we can think of the complex world In the complex world, there's this sort of parallel phenomenon, which is you can get a sequence of vector bundles, En, which tends to infinity, which is not a bundle, but is a torsion-free sheaf. Yeah, three. R, E, E, good. Sheaf. OK. And this, uh, this bundle, if you want, sits inside its, or the sheaf rather, sits inside its double dual. And that is, for a complex surface, a vector bundle. But it's not a bundle of the same degree as these. And so you're seeing this in the complex world as this limit is not a vector bundle. The thing that's sort of left behind in this Uhlenbeck theorem is this double dual. So you're seeing that comes out. And from the variational point of view, um, maybe I'll just put it here, it's the type of thing where you're, you're there, there are two sort of forms of, of limit, if you want. OK, you can be trying to minimize something in a nice non-degenerate bowl like this, and you're going down and everything is good. Or you can be in an infinite trough. And when you're trying to minimize, you're taking a sequence that's going off like that to infinity. And it's, that's the, the sort of metaphor for what's going on here. Okay, so that is the sort of general situation, and it's what basically um, shows that the, the hope of trying to do what Atiyah and Bott do for Yang Mills on a Riemann surface doesn't quite work. And yet, um, something, something good does occur, but it occurs in a limit. And it's a very strange situation. And again, it has an intuition that's sort of half topological and half physical. And it's linked to the geometry of particle spaces. OK. OK, so um, I'm going to put in a little bit extra data. This will be, um, and I'm just going to look at the ASD world only, just to make life easy on myself. M star K is going to be 
the moduli of based ASD connections. So what is it? It's a pair considering of an ASD connection plus a trivialization at a point. Okay, so I'm giving myself a little bit of extra data that allows certain operations. And this is going to be inside this big infinite dimensional space of CK star, which is just the affine space of all connections mod the unitary gauge, which will be the module, well, just the space of all connections. And again, with the base connection. So space of all based connections. OK. And the, um, the theorem, which um, was a conjecture of Etienne Siegel, uh, Etienne Jones, rather, and uh, which I, with some Charles Boyer, Ben Mann, and Jim Milgram proved um, a very while ago. So it's, it's a, a theorem. But of course, it's, it's known as the, the Atiyah Jones conjecture. Um, is that the inclusion The star is the is the where it means based. K. K. Ah, good point. Thank you. Thank you. That's very important. Okay, so it's the integral of the second Chern class on the on the manifold. So thought of as a number. Um, so that's that's actually very important. So thank you for remarking. Um, so this inclusion here is a uh, induces I k star isomorphisms um, between the homotopy groups for i less than some linear function of k. OK, it's linear and, of course, with positive slope. Otherwise, it becomes a rather dumb. Um, OK, so you've got a, some linear function. In fact, it's basically k. And then you, you k minus 3 or 2 or something like that because you're, you've got this uh, problem. So what happens is you let k grow. Um, this is an infinite dimensional space. Uh, just a bit of sort of simple ideas show that they're all the same for all k. Okay, there's a map that induces a homotopy equivalence here. This is, is roughly a 8k dimensional for SU2 for the other, other you know, SUN, there's another, there are other numbers, but say it's sort of, again, a linear function of k is the dimension, so 8k for SU2. Okay, minus some constants. Okay, so this, this grows with k. So we've got a manifold that's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And as it's growing, it's gobbling up all the, the uh, topology that lives in, in CK. So the variational situation is horrible, and yet there's this sort of odd thing going. Now, as I was saying, it's sort of linked to um, particle behavior. And indeed, they, there is a special class of solutions that Etienne Jones considered that's sitting inside MK, and they consider the, the composition. And these particle-like solutions were described by Tehuft. And uh, they came up with this conjecture, and they a, a bit of uh, evidence for it. And um, 
as I say, it's, it's a theorem. Okay, so it gets um, okay. Oops. Okay, good. I thought I'd lost a page. Okay, um, the original Atia Jones was for, in fact, well, these these instantons you can forget the complex structure. So originally it was for the four sphere, but it extends to other x. And in fact, it's it's proven for the four sphere and a few other manifolds, but it's it's open again for for x arbitrary. So um, maybe I should explain how this sort of the setup for this thing, um, and give you an idea of what what's going on. Yeah, they're homotopically, they're the same. So I'll show you how. K and K Yeah. So that then, no, as a K goes to infinity, you get some kind of, the direct limit is infinite. Yeah, th this, is, this is always the same space, basically. And this is getting bigger and bigger. Oh, well, they're the same space. Yeah. So these, for all K, they're the same. But that's, but that's infinite. Right? Yeah, it's an infinite dimensional space of all connections. It's for the four sphere you get. So in other words, that would be like a direct limit of non x. Yeah. So for the four sphere you get them, I guess it's loop loop three of the group. Okay, so it's that type of space. It behaves like a yeah. You know, it's a big function space. Okay, so how does this Well, for one thing, um, you can stabilize. So what there is is there's a map, sort of S for stabilization, which takes CK star to CK plus 1 star. And it's a homotopy equivalence. And the way you do it is as follows. You have your, your four-dimensional manifold x here. You've got your trivialization at a point, which homotopically you enlarge to a disk. So you've trivialized here. Okay, and you've got um, a bundle with C2 equals K here. Now you take a connection on the four sphere. Again, you choose something. This is a fixed connection. It's got charge one, and you've trivialized here And you've used the conformal group acting on the sphere. And the, the self-duality, anti-self-duality are, are conformally invariant. And you squeeze down, so if you're trivializing the North Pole, you, you squeeze down towards the South Pole. So basically, you should think of having the curvature is almost all here. Almost all here. Okay, so you, you've concentrated all the curvature here. So the bundle's almost flat here. It's trivial and almost flat. And here you, you've trivialized. Okay, then what do you do? You take a connected sum. So you open this up, open that up. Glue, uh, you've got your curvature that's still living here. X, of course, when you take a connected sum with the four sphere, you just get back X again. And um, yeah, that's that's um, that's what you do. Now there are lots of details because you're interested in, in these these manifolds have metrics and you have to worry about metrics and things. But that's the idea. 
Okay, and what tau shows you is you can arrange that the gluing uh, doesn't increase energy too much. Basically, you, you can arrange for things that if you map CK, remember MK is down here, here's CK, and you map it to CK plus 1, it'll take an epsilon neighborhood here and map it to some, I don't know, A epsilon, so some rescaling of it, but you're not losing too much. So that goes into here. Okay, so your minima, when you do your mapping, will sort of live in this collar here. Um, So you like to think of just being able to push the collar down. It doesn't quite work because uh, there are sort of obstructions to solving the nonlinear PDE, which means there's a finite dimensional obstruction space there that you can't push down, but you've got an infinite amount of room because it's an infinite dimensional space. So for all intents and purposes, you can push it down. Okay. The MK stand does not go to the MK plus one stand. No. Um, sorry, this was a plus one here. It goes close. You can make it basically as close as you want. What you do is you push this all the way to the, you make this more and more like a delta function. And this more and more flat and so on. Um, so there is some retraction or something? Hmm? Yeah, I was saying that the retraction, it's not quite a retraction because there, there's, if you, you, there's sort of linear obstructions to solving the, the uh, the um, self-duality equations. So you should think of the, 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 the subspace in here is sort of a finite co-dimension. So there's a sort of strip in here that you can sort of push it down. So there, there's extra work if you sort of play around with the gluings and things like that, which basically is what this guy does for a living. There, I don't know if you ever tried to read one of his papers, but. It's dizzying, <laughs> um, but it's it's uh, it's dizzying, and it's usually eighty pages. So <laughs> it's also a funny style. He he starts with the result, and then he says, "Well, then I need this." So he proves that, and then to prove that, he says, "I need this," and you you get a sort of graph of the. <laughs> <laughs> like that. And when you're sort of down here, it's proven. <laughs> so it's, it's a, uh, it does mean, of course, it's easy to get the result from it, but it's, it's also that uh, it's a, uh, you can get a little bit lost. Okay, he, he shows one other, in another paper, um, stabilization in the homotopy. And he shows that basically he can, he can fix this L, this S. So this was, a, sorry, CK plus 1 here. This was the map S. He can do the following. OK, so you have MK that's down here. You've got CK that's up here. And you've got if you want a relative homotopy class, so a map of a disk, right? And its boundary is, is down there. It's this, this sort of thing that's going up. And, and he shows that being, by being clever and um, sort of modifying the parameters in his gluing and, like I said, being very clever, um, you can arrange that 
So this is in C. And it's, it's for a class alpha here. This, this number actually depends on alpha. Um, so we have C, CK plus L of alpha star. You can arrange that the, the alpha here lives in, a, in an epsilon neighborhood. And he shows furthermore that you can put in a retraction now, having been clever, so that alpha is actually down here. In other words, um, if you look at this, this um, It means, what, what it's going to mean is that in the limit, if you take the limit of both spaces, of the MKs and the CKs, <coughs> there will be, the limit classes will be the same. But it doesn't prevent new stuff being born all the time. Okay? And it's just that class that's born in K equals 293, that dies in 295, while there's another one being created in 295 that has to wait till 312 to die, while there's another one being created in 312 that has to wait till 472 to die, and so on. Okay, so, so new stuff can be created all the time. All you know is that once it's created, by stabilizing, you can squeeze it to zero. Okay, so it's, it's, um, it's an amazing theorem already, and it's totally general, doesn't depend on X, but it, it um, say induces zero on um, pi star. So on alpha belonged to say pi i of uh, the relative pi i, so ck star, mk star. Okay, so that's the, the theorem. And so you do get, in other words, the limits are the same, but it's, it's, you know, with these algebraic limits, all sorts of wacky things can happen. So, in other words, the limit of pi star of mk is the limit of pi star of ck. Now, pi star of ck, of course, is a constant. Because this, by the way, was a homotopy equivalence. And why is it a homotopy equivalence? Because you can take something of charge minus one and glue it on out here, okay? And then forget, freeze what's going on here and let these guys fight it out. They go to zero, and then you're back where you started. So that's your homotopy inverse. Okay, so you can, you can, um, um, so these are all the same. So the next step is you have to thing in the moral is you, you need um, better information. So this is probably step two. And you need better info on um, stabilization. Of okay. No. It's pure pure topology. It's Riemannian because it's it's after all you've got these these equations that depend on a well on a conformal structure, but the Riemannian structure. But the model I could depend on only kind of the limit. Yeah. Yeah, now th there's another sort of feature that you should remember of these that's, that's, again, very intriguing. Remember that all the Donaldson invariants are taking the unstable topology and deducing amazing things, right? The, all these non-standard structures on, you know, differentiable structures and all these things coming from these things. Stably, whoop, it's all gone. At least if the conjecture is true, I mean, in some sense. And, and this already shows that sort of it's, you know, not likely to, to get you there. So it's, it's, a, it's a very, uh, I mean, the, the, the game is quite subtle. OK. Um, OK, I seem to have a, a, incredible amounts of difficulty ordering a finite set of pages. Um, <laughs> OK. 
So you need better information on the stabilization of MK. So here, um, I'm going to specialize, specialize to just x equals S4. And we go into the holomorphic world. Now, of course, this is a well-known complex manifold. Um, just kidding. It's, um, but you really think, should think of this because it's conformal, right? It's R4 union and infinity. And if you think of it that way, uh, well, it's one of the things that might justify the, uh, the following is that, um, and it's a theorem of Donaldson with a little bit of a twist on it. Again, another theorem. Um, is that MK star of S4 is the set of holomorphic bundles on the original theorem was P1 cross P1, but you just take a, a birational transform. And they are not trivial, but trivialized. Remember, you've got a star here. So trivialized on, um, and I'm just going to take two points here, two lines, P1 cross 0, union um, infinity cross P1. OK, so maybe I'll draw a little picture here. But P1 cross P1, infinity is out here, here's zero, and the bundle is trivial along these two lines. The complement of that, of course, is R4, and that's where the, the action lives, and the thing that you stuck on at infinity was where the bundle was flat and trivial and nothing was happening. Okay, but somehow this is the, the sort of most convenient infinity to work with. Okay. Now, I want you to think of the following thing. You've got a bundle it's trivialized along here. Now, uh, and it's also trivialized along here. So in particular, the bundle is trivial on this vertical fiber. And the way bundles on P1 behave is they actually live in a very, very small set. So maybe I'll just write it here. OK. So bundles on P1 are sums of line bundles. And the thing that characterizes a line bundle uh, on P1 is just one number, its degree. Bundles on P1 is equal to a sum OA1 plus OA2 plus OAN. OK, they're all like that. And OK, so it's a discrete set. And you say, well, how does it behave in a family? And it behaves in a family so as to, and I might as well order them, because otherwise I'm going to go nuts. OK? It behaves in a family in such a way that the distance between the biggest and the smallest is minimal. OK? So in particular, so generically, so minimal. An minus A1. And then in this family, if so, the generic case, if you've got a bundle where it's trivial, it's going to be trivial generically. So if you've got one, one line here that's trivial, if you're looking at the nearby lines, everything else will be, be trivial here. And as you're sort of moving along, you'll all of a sudden hit one line where the structure goes pop. It jumps. OK? So. Um, here, zero, and then at exceptional lines, the structure jumps. Okay. Now, um, <clears throat> just think, suppose the bundle is trivial on this, this piece here. OK. Now, what choices have you got? It's trivial along this line. Trivialized. So there's a choice privilege basis. Well, then anything else, because the bundle is trivial here in global sections, the compact manifold of a trivial bundle, um, any, any sort of automorphism here 
is sort of extends automatically to the whole thing. In other words, it's totally rigid. There's no choices. Okay? Two such bundles that are trivial on the thing, because they've got this trivialization here, once you've matched up the trivialization, everything else matches too. So there's, there's no freedom, there's no choice. The only freedom that happens is when you hit these exceptional lines, the jumping lines. Okay? So elsewhere, it, it's, it's entirely canonical. There's no, there's no families, there's no nothing. No choices. And the only places where there are choices are these, these jumping lines. Okay, so what happens is the, the moduli concentrates at the jumping lines. Okay. Now, how does it concentrate? Well, I want you to think of an analogy Maybe. Yeah. I want you to think of holomorphic maps to degree k. I'm going to talk about these on Wednesday anyway. Of, from the Riemann sphere to itself. And they're going to be base maps. So 0 is the, uh, let's see, uh, what do I want? I want infinity sent to 0. So there's a basing condition. OK. And how do you write these? Well, generically, simple poles, right? So you can write f of z to be a sum ai over z minus bi. OK. Now, you notice there's no pole at infinity, so bi is, these belong to C. And if it's simple poles, these are non-zero residues, so these are elements of C star. And that is your generic map. Okay? In co-dimension one, there's one double pole. Okay? And so you can write f of z to be, there'll be a sum ai z minus bi, and this would start at, say, 2, and then there's a second, there's just one exceptional point, which is going to be a1 plus a1 prime z minus b1 over z minus b1 squared. So here, this belongs to c, this belongs to c star, and that's in C. So, and of course, the poles are distinct, right? So that's the, the sort of generic picture. And as you go sort of deeper and deeper into this space of holomorphic maps, you can get, have, you know, higher and higher co-dimension loci where there are a whole bunch of poles come together and they, they coalesce, right? So you've got the generic stratum, simple poles, co-dimension one stratum, one double pole. Co-dimension two, it's either two double poles or one triple pole. Co-dimension four, you know, one quadruple pole, two, et cetera. Okay, so it goes, as they concentrate, they, uh, they become rare. Okay, so you have the same picture here. Okay, so... Um, Okay, so here's your infinity, which is zero. Let's call it D. Okay, and you've got your jumping lines, and you can take a projection down to, to P1. Okay. Um, suppose I look at the sheaf. It's going to be R1 pi star of E minus D doesn't matter really. Anyway, it's here the bundle is trivial. If you look at what this gives, it's zero. It's zero, and it's only at the jumping lines that it concentrates. And what it does is create little point sheaves here, okay, which encode the multiplicity. So basically, the thing that's living here is a vector space of rank k1, rank k2, and so on. 
okay? And so it's a multiplicity, ki, and the result is that some ki is equal to k. So in other words, you, you've got a holomorphic vector bundle on this product, you push it down, you get numbers associated to points, and you should think of these as the multiplicity of those poles there, because that's what they are really, okay? So you've got multiplicities of poles. Okay, so now the, the, the algorithm for building the moduli space. So, build MK, one, you choose a stratum. So you choose multiplicities, k1 to kl, sum ki equals k. Okay, so they, they, that's the charge here. Two, you um, choose the locations of the poles. I'll use b here, just the b1 to b. L, okay? And three for each BL, okay? Choose, and here you have the analog of the residues here. And what it is is a local modulus, an element of the local moduli of jumping lines. So there are finite dimensional spaces associated to each of these. And you, well, you have to understand a little bit, not too much, but a little bit of what these so I'll just call it a frame to jump. A multiplicity k. Of k i. B i. We'll get there in the end. Okay, so for each b i, choose a frame to jump of multiplicity b i, k i. So in a space, let's call it f j. in fj ki. Okay, so there's a finite dimensional space, which you think of it as like, the sp that, like C star over there for the maps. Okay, and then you glue. Okay, so you put trivial bundle here, trivial bundle here. You've got the framing that tells you how to glue, and you've built a map. Okay, so what have you got? You've got a stratified space, Okay, of with strata. Okay, the strata are what? They're labeled particles. Okay, so with multiplicities. So you put a particle here, you put a particle here. They're of different colors, possibly, because they've got different multiplicities. But basically, otherwise, they're just moving around where they feel like it. OK, so that's your, that's your picture of the space. Now, how do you think of this in terms of the instanton? What this means, basically, because something funny is happening here, you should think somehow that the curvature is sort of living here, right? And so in this four-dimensional space, you're seeing basically a two-dimensional shadow down below of the locations of the sort of the actual instanton particles, okay? Um, and they're sort of living down below here. But you've got this stratified space. What am I doing, by the way? Oh, dear. Okay. Uh, how long do you want me to? Ten minutes? Is that okay? Yeah, ten minutes is fine. Look at the homology of particle spaces. And basically there exists an accountancy um, for a cycle of dimension j. You need at most uh, 2j particles. Okay. 
Okay, so in other words, the number of particles you need to describe a cycle is at most 2j, and that's just basically taking two particles and labeling them by the base point in the particle in the label space and just moving them around each other. Okay, so that's, that's the worst case scenario. Obviously, if you're choosing in your frame jump space, choosing some big cycle, a large fat cycle that's already in the label space, you just need one particle to move it, to, to create it. Okay, but it's the number of particles you need to, to do it. Okay. The other thing you have to notice is there exists a good stabilization map. And what it does, okay, is just adds a particle, a particle of multiplicity one. Okay, so you've got in your, your base point is out here at infinity, you've got your label maps, and you just add in an extra point near infinity. Okay, and obviously you've got an infinite amount of room to add in an extra point, an extra point, an extra point, so you can build a sort of limit space. And what this does is it respects the stratification because you just added in an extra particle, okay? So, stratification, you've got a Lorray spectral sequence. Okay, two things. Either there are lots of particles, in which case all your classes up to dimension, sort of the number of particles over two, is already built up. Okay, so remember if you're looking at the Lorray spectral sequence, you're looking at the, everything gets shifted by the co-dimension of the stratum. Okay, so either your, your cohomology has, the, the co-dimension is low, because you've got, and then you've got lots and lots of particles, but then the things up to dimension J are already built up, or your co-dimension is high, in which case you're not seeing it. So it doesn't matter what's happening, basically. So basically it's saying that any class you're going to see here, you've already seen here. And so the space is stabilizing. And in fact, it splits. So it's, it's a very, very uh, concrete. And this, is, this, this accountancy is, it's, I mean, there are a whole bunch of sort of operations. People like Cohen, um, Milgram, and so on, were made their sort of careers on, well, no, not all of them. Anyway, they, they, did, they did a lot of work on, on these things in the, I guess in the 60s and 70s, and uh, in understanding these maps. So basically, you need the co-dimensions, you need to understand a few things about these, these spaces, but very little, and it's just a general behavior of particles. Um, this thing, this theorem, you can use similar ideas for any ruled surface. If you're doing a sort of bundles over ruled surface, it gets a little bit more complicated, but you can still use the, this, this general idea. Um, getting from homology to homotopy normally is very difficult. It still is kind of hard. But there's a wonderful thing where, where you can sort of at least show that the pi 1 is abelian. Because if you've got labeled particles, then with a bit of work, you can have one loop sort of living in this set of particles and one loop living in that set of particles. And as they're far apart, it doesn't matter which order you're doing them in. And so the, the, the fundamental group is abelian. That simplifies life a lot. The other comment is, once you know this Atiyah-Jones conjecture for the four sphere, well, because you have this conformal action, in fact, you're showing that the, the, you're building up the homotopy, space, homotopy theory of the, the space of connections um, in terms not only of, of these instantons, but squeezing them down in terms of highly concentrated instantons. So very particle-like solutions. You can then turn around and use that and on an arbitrary four-manifold on X, you can build a particle model of low energy, so connections 
essentially using the four sphere connections. But now you know that the four sphere connections give you all the homotopy theory you need locally, but you sort of have these things move around. And um, so you can build a model for the space of all connections. And so you're seeing this, this finite stabilization. It doesn't quite give you the, the Atiyah Jones for arbitrary x, but at least shows you that the, the thing is plausible. So, so it's, it's the, the moral here is that these, first of all, these, these sort of infinite particle, particle descriptions are actually quite useful. They, they sort of occur in, naturally in the complex geometry. They occur in the, if you want, in the, um, in the physics to a certain degree, right? sort of particles versus fields. Um, they also occur in the homotopy models that these things have, have, people have built, and they've been doing it for 40 years. And so it's, it's sort of particles is everywhere. And with this deep philosophical <laughs> I'll stop. Anyway, thanks for your patience. So, thanks. What is supposed to be a particle? Is it a It's literally just, uh, you know, you've got a space where, I mean, it's, it's literally just, you know, you, you, you've got a space of, of things with labels, and you're just putting them down where you feel like putting them, and that's the space. Okay, so the, the, the thing that's sort of messy is that the, you know, a space of multiplicity one, we've got, say, two particles of multiplicity one, they can coalesce. So it's just a stratified picture. But on each stratum, they're just moving freely. So in other words, you've got a, a, a very concrete the description. Strata. Hmm? The strata, you call it a particle? Yeah, the, the stratum is the configuration of multiplicities. Okay, so you just think of poles, like that, that picture of poles of maps from S2 to S2, okay? That's, that's the sort of paradigm. The generic stratum is, what is it? It's, it's simple poles with a residue in C star. So your label space is C star, instead of being this, um, this FK space. Well, I guess I've erased it, but this, this space of frame jumps, it's C star instead, okay? So if you want to build a generic rational map, you choose your points. And then you choose an arbitrary element of C star for each point. That's it. Okay. So you, in other words, you've got a lot of control, at least stratum by stratum on the topology, because it's a sort of free. You know, they're free data. There are no, no constraining equations basically, apart from they they have to stay separate on the stratum. Doing explicit computations is actually very difficult. If you're trying to solve the you know solve the spectral sequence, in other words step by step and seeing you know, the differentials and what gets killed, that's a horrible mess. But it doesn't really matter because you know that whatever mess is happening up here, isomorphic mess is happening down here. And so whatever it is, <laughs> it's the same. Okay? It doesn't actually give you the, the, the topology of the spaces. And, and I remember trying with Jim Milgram to compute. We managed to compute one differential, which in fact increased our stability range by a factor of two. So it was showing that those things, that those, those cycles where, where one particle whizzes around the other are basically trivial. So they fill in in the full space, which is normal. If you think of two, two poles of multiplicity one, you can coalesce them into a double pole. Okay, so you just need a little transversal disk, basically, in the, in the space, and that's all. So that, 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 it's just that, basically, but it, it already sort of helped. After that, it's, it's horrible, because the spaces are quite singular, the way they fit together and things like that. They, the stratified spaces, they work, I mean, but they, they don't. Is anything known about the homotopy groups in the limit? Of the CK? Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, I mean, for, for S4, it'd be loop 3S3. So typically, you'd use these co-fibrations that, that, that I mentioned for the, the surfaces. So it'd be similar pictures. So you take a cell decomposition of your four manifold, and then sort of build it up as a as a you know an iterated fibration. So that that would be the and you know the, the uh, with a bit of luck you know the the, the uh, at least for the homology the the um, these vibrations are sometimes, fairly often, 
homologically trivial, and you know you get good results.